welcome to a time when there were no guitars and no drums, just synthesizers. It was the 1970s. The place was Britain, and our heroes were a maverick bunch of young pioneers, obsessed by Kraftwerk and science fiction. All across the country, these synthetic dreamers would imagine the very sound of the future yesterday. And by the 80s, their dreams would become a reality as Britain went synth pop. Welcome to a time when machines ruled the world. By the 1970s, we were living in the future. Our cities were going space age. Victorian slums had been torn down and replaced by ultra-modern concrete high-rises. Entertainment also looked to the future. Our cinema and television screens were full of tantalising glimpses of a future that seemed just around the corner. Released in 1971, Stanley Kubrick's Clockwork Orange was a futuristic and violent vision of concrete Britain that captured the zeitgeist. The film's soundtrack was composed by American synth pioneer Walter, now Wendy Carlos. It would have a profound effect on a generation of would-be musicians. That was probably a lot of people's maybe first time they'd heard electronic music, you know, on the score to that film. It made me forever associate classical music with people getting their heads kicked in, which is, is kind of a bit strange. The soundtrack to Clockwork Orange, fantastic synth sounds in that, you know, big Moog synthesizer that Wendy Carlos used. And they were all orchestrated. Well, Wendy, who, who then said she was Walter, I've, I've never quite worked out what was going on there, was, was an absolute inspiration, you know. And the first time we'd ever heard that sort of absorbent synth bass sound, and it just raved about it. Some of the people who would be the future post-punk people would listen to the, the, the three or four sort of original compositions that Carlos did on that soundtrack that were much more sinister and foreboding. There was a kind of uh, a linkage made there between those sounds and the idea of a cold future, a bleak future, and that probably sort of sunk quite deeply into the psyche of a lot of young musicians at that time. For a generation of electronic dreamers, Carlos's soundtrack would offer a glimpse of an alienated synthetic future. But the true divine spark would arrive on our television screens in 1975. Tomorrow's World gave Britain its first glimpse of Kraftwerk, a German band who played only electronic instruments. They would invade our shores later the same year. We played one of our first gigs, 1975, of our English tour in Liverpool. The Wings Over Britain tour was playing the same night in the town. That was also the reason why our hall was only half crowded. Fun, 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 
All of our posters were stuck right next to the posters of the wings, so it made us proud, of course, you know. Amazingly, they came to Liverpool um, in October of 75, and I sat in seat Q36 and witnessed the first day of the rest of my life. 75 was all, you know, the era of long hair and flared trousers and guitar solos. And these guys all came out in suits and ties. Two of them looked like they were playing electronic tea trays with wired up knitting needles. And I was just blown away. It really, it was, it was incredible. We had no long hair, we didn't wear blue jeans. We'd, we had suits on grey suits, short hair, you know and we looked like uh, uh, the children of Werner von Braun or Werner von Siemens. And we saw us so, you know, engineer musicians like that, instead of dancing uh, boys on, on, on stage to arouse the girls, you know. The interesting thing afterwards, there was a knock at our backstage door. It was a band. They were called Orchestral Manoeuvres in the Dark, and the leader, Andy McCluskey was really astonished and happy that he uh, was meeting us in person. And he said, you know, guys, you have shown us the future. This is it. We throw away our guitars tomorrow and buy all synthesizers. In terms of inspiring people to, to not just have a synthesizer in their rock band, but to be completely electronic, I think you, you can never underestimate the impact of craft work. Trans Europe Express had the same impact on the synth poppers that the anarchy in the UK had on people who wanted to be punk rockers. Next year, Kraftwerk hoped to eliminate the keyboards altogether and build jackets with electronic lapels, which can be played by touch. In British music in the mid 70s, the synth was a remote beast. Although they would become much cheaper later in the decade, a synthesizer then could cost as much as a small house. They were associated with rich and technically gifted progressive musicians. Until punk came along, you had to be Keith Emerson. If you wanted to be in a band, you had to have learnt your instrument for at least eight or nine years before you would dare come out and play it. And it was the simply the inspiration of, of The Damned and The Clash. Um... We're in my studio at home in South East London. One day I opened my email inbox and there was like 10 emails from a very disparate bunch of people saying, you've got to go to eBay now and buy this. And what it was was Kraftwerk's original vocoder, which was being sold on eBay. And it was the one that was used on Autobahn. I thought, well, this is the equivalent to, for a guitarist of getting Jimi Hendrix's guitar that was used on Purple Haze or something, you know. TVOD. I first got a synthesizer TVOD. in TVOD. 1977. And I bought a second hand called 700S TVOD. from Macari's music TVOD. shop in Charing Cross Road. The thing that pissed me off about punk was you had to learn three chords to, to be in a punk band. If you had a synthesizer, all you had to do was press one key with a finger, you know. I don't need a TV screen. I just stick the aerial into my skin. Advances in technology in the late 70s heralded the invention of the affordable synth, costing no more than an electric guitar. Daniel Miller used his to form The Normal, an experimental act that supported punk groups. Miller drew on the work of English author J.G. Ballard, whose crash was another futuristic vision of Britain. Warm. Leatherette. Warm. Leatherette. I'd just broken up with a girlfriend who you know, I was very much in love with, and a friend of mine said, I'll read this book. I don't know. <laughs> and I read it, and it sort of really um, had a huge, I was using all these puns, like impact, but <laughs> it had a huge impact on it. See the breaking glass in the underpass. 
It wasn't like science fiction in the sense that it was out of space and stuff like that. It felt like it was five minutes into the future. And I loved that aspect of it, the fact that it was, it was kind of so outrageous, but so possible at the same time. Leatherette. Uh, warm Leatherette by The Normal. The Normal was the alias of Daniel Miller. Hear the, crushing steel. the lyrics are just a pricey of some of the concepts in in Crash, Ballard's novel, which was about people who have car accidents and find that thereafter their sexuality has been diverted and they, they are obsessed with being turned on by car crashes. So, you know, the lyric like, the handbrake penetrates your thigh, quick, let's make love before you die. <laughs> the music was supposed to be visual, you know, like driving along a, you know, a highway with big buildings either side and going into a tunnel. There's, a lot, there's quite a lot of humour in it, really. I mean, I, it wasn't meant to be, like, ap apocalyptic or dystopian. Miller was one of Britain's first synth poets, and he wasn't alone. In the north of England, a bunch of computer programmers dreamt of a similar future. Well, we, we love J.G. Ballard, and in, in fact, you know, Roxy had a song, 2HB, uh, about Humphrey Bogart, and we had a song for, for J.G., which was about J.G. Ballard. The future were a bunch of sci-fi nerds from Sheffield. They formed in 77 and played only synthesizers. When I bought my Korg 700S in 1976, it was the first time there was a monophonic synthesizer which you could do stuff with, which was kind of domestic level, entry level, in terms of price. It was 350 quid, I think. And I remember distinctly thinking at the time, I was a computer operator, and there was a decision day where it was either buy a second-hand car and learn to drive, or go and buy this, this monophonic synthesizer. And uh, that proved to be quite a fateful day, because I still can't drive, but um, I still got that synthesizer. This is a, a Mini Korg 700S and, and was sort of the first affordable synth. A fantastic machine, completely eccentric. They give you a book, a book of patches with it and because it was Japanese there would be, be things like, like synthy cat or funny frog, you know, and you can't follow why it's doing what it does, but it sounds great. Usually with a synthesizer you can get it to do something for you that you, you know, you don't have to be manually good at all. That was why we turned to them in the first place, because no one could learn how to do the guitars either, because we'd all tried. My brother's a, a great guitarist and he tried to teach me. It just hurts your hand. So we uh, use these things and you, you know, you can press a switch on them and they'll, they'll do things for about 10 minutes. It's quite interesting. If you've got a tape recorder, you can put it down, put something next to it and it'll sound all right. The day that I joined the band, Martin came round to my house and he had two, two records under his arm. One was Trans Europe Express and one was I Feel Love. And he said, look, we can do this. I, th I think that was, that was his actual phrase. We loved all that stuff. I mean, like the concept albums that uh, George Romero did with uh, Donna Summer. One, two, three, four, five. We used to play those continuously. And this wasn't some kind of post-gay ironic thing. It's just because they sounded great and interesting and you're never really sure what the next set of sounds coming up was going to be. I feel it just didn't sound like any record that had been before. It's a, it came on the radio and, and you couldn't quite believe what you were hearing. It was hypnotic, but it was driving. Maroda's Moog music was the disco single of 77. Its success would set the template for the future of the future. We were in fact much more influenced by Maroda than we were by Kraftwerk. Everyone, ever since anyone that knows we use since, oh, you sound like Kraftwerk, don't you? Well, we use the same instruments, so some of the sounds are, are a bit the same. We never really wanted to be Kraftwerk. We wanted to be a pop band. We wanted to embody a sense of futurism without being so literal. And it just so happened we, uh, a friend of ours, he had bought for him this um, science fiction board game called Star Force. And it was prodigiously tedious. I mean, it was real geek stuff. 
uh, and it was impenetrable. You couldn't play it. There was the rise of the Humor League or something. And we thought, the Humor League, that is such a cool name. The Human League set out to make electronic pop for the modern city. The Human League had a totally different spin on synthesizers where it was much more like this bright, technocratic optimism thing and in fact in one of their early songs blind youth you know they make fun of people who go on about dehumanization you know the city's okay I'd say most of the brightness came from Martin. Martin's very optimistic, and if anyone's moaning about anything, Martin will go and write a song in the opposite direction. I think I felt a bit gloomy about the concrete jungle and everything, which is ridiculous, because I'm a townie. You know, I, I gravitate towards concrete, if, you know. <laughs> if you put me in the country, I would just find the nearest town and go and I'll be sitting in a bar quite quickly. Blind you take hope, you're no joke, so good time is you make fun. Unfortunately, British pop music wasn't quite ready for a synth-led group of futurists just yet. But in 1978, the Human League weren't the only group experimenting with electronics in Sheffield. This is the old um, Salterline Art College, which used to be part of Sheffield Polytechnic in the 1970s. I believe the Human League also played this very place for their first ever uh, live show in Sheffield. Cabaret Voltaire did perform um, in this very room. Yeah, I mean, we just thought there was nothing nothing for us, you know? I mean, it was all kind of bloated super groups and, and, and progressive bands who weren't even from the same kind of social backgrounds, you know, they, they were probably public school educated, whereas I think, you know, most of the scene in Sheffield was pretty solid, kind of working class. You, you'd find little bits of uh, interesting music within perhaps some of the prog rock stuff where there'd be a weird little synth break. But then, you know, once you kind of start to discover all the German bands, you realise that there were entire albums that were made of electronics. Whilst the Human League dreamt of pop, Cabaret Voltaire were anything but, using electronics to explore Sheffield, a city torn between the past and the future. I remember watching loads of science fiction things in the 60s, like Doctor Who and things like Quatermass. And all these kind of strange things seem to happen in kind of old gasworks or industrial environment. There was another worldliness about it. You might see an alien or a giant blob creeping across the floor, glowing bright green from radioactivity. Very arty group. They, obviously, their name echoes Dada. Um, they were really into William Burroughs and his ideas of like control and surveillance. They actually used quite a lot of guitar, but it was so heavily processed it didn't sound like rock and roll guitar. It sounded more like a synthesizer. They also put synthesizing type effects on the voice, which is probably one of the most disturbing things they did. You know, they have a guy singing, but it sounds more, more like a Dalek than you know a human being. At night time, you'd hear distant booming noises, which, you know, would probably be something like a drop forge or steam hammer or something. You, you certainly knew that you were, you were on the edge of, you know, heavy industry. Everything in their music was kind of alienated and, you know, the music that comes from people who are kind of divorced from any kind of natural life, any 
and natural rhythms, uh, the music for a, a, a kind of hostile environment. If I've ever been asked to explain that movement, I always call it the alienated synthesists. And, uh, you know, Throbbing Gristle, Cabaret Voltaire, Joy Division, uh, who were, were a little bit less obviously synthy. Um, everyone, everyone was sort of like that. We were all going around in long coats from second hand shops and, and saying how terrible things were with a synth. Across the Pennines, another pocket of alienated synthesists dreamt of an electronic future in the spiritual home of British pop music. We are in Matthew Street in Liverpool and I'm actually standing outside of the door to what used to be Eric's Club, which is where we played our first gig where we invented OMD to play at this place. And it was, of course, the club where we all used to come. Um, the, the Bunny Men and the Teardrops played within a month of us playing here as well. This was a place I saw Devo play their first English concert. And all of the influential bands that we could get to come to town played here, apart from Kraftwerk, who played the big theatre down the road. And then literally, 10 yards away, is the Cavern Club. You've got Eric's and the Cavern right across the road from each other. When Paul and I started uh, being interested in electronic music, we were very young. We had no money, and it was totally unrealistic to think about getting you know, the big kind of keyboards that you saw on TV or on stage with some of the, the keyboard players in the 70s. My mother had a K's mail order catalogue and they had some synthesizers. Our first Korg micro preset was bought from my mother's catalogue for 36 weeks at 7.76 a week, I seem to recall. This was the first synth and we'd made the first, really the first two albums with this, you know, and it's like, um, it's a quite a basic synth. <laughs> Can you believe that's the record? The major record labels largely ignored synth music, forcing bands like OMD to look to newly formed indies instead. In 1978, OMD would sign to Factory. A movement of sorts was beginning to coalesce. I think the first wave of bands that sort of came out of the closet in the late 70s, um, we were all working independently of each other. There was no unified movement. It didn't all start in one club or one town. There was no gang of people who all had a manifesto that we were going to do the new British electronic music. It was small pockets of people in different parts of the country who were independently, obviously, listening to the same things. I, I did make an electronic drum machine, but I'd seen Kraftwerk with their sticks, so I thought, I can make one of those, and so I did. And so some of the early sort of synth drums were this, was this sort of very Heath Robinson looking box with all these plates on there, with these sort of sticks with wires that, that we did the, the drums to uh, electricity. horrified when Tony Wilson said, you know, what you do is the future of pop. We're like, pop? Yeah, we're experimental, German-influenced. You know, we're not pop at all. How dare you call us pop? We were absolutely mortified. Uh, we couldn't see it at all. Totally by accident, Paul and I, and I guess others at the time, had distilled the electronic experimentation and the kind of glam pop of Britain from just a few years earlier into what was going to become, which didn't seem at the time, but was going to become the future of pop music. By the start of 1979, the future of pop music seemed a long way off, as the combined efforts of the normal, OMD and the Human League had failed to trouble the charts. But dabbling in synthesizers was becoming increasingly de rigueur, even for dyed-in-the-wool punks. 
At the other end of the East Lanx Road, another factory band, who would become one of the greatest electronic acts, were taking their first synthetic steps. The first synthesizer we had in Joy Division was a, a little thing called Transcendent 2000, and I actually built it from a load of components. At the time, I had insomnia, I couldn't sleep very well. So I, got, I used to get this magazine called Electronics Today or something like that. And in it was this synthesizer. And, and if you were to buy one in those days, it was incredibly expensive. And we didn't have any money. So I thought, well, this is really cheap. It's only like 200 quid. And how difficult can it be to build it? And it was like soldering components in, you know, by hand. It took about two months of doing that and then it didn't work incredibly well, you know. I remember we went to write a track in a studio called Cargo in uh, Rochdale, and when we went in, I, I'd, uh, we found a little Woolworths organ that you switched the battery power, switched it on and it blew a fan. You could play chord buttons on it, so I was messing about with these chord buttons and then, Martin Hanna, I think, had brought in a Selena string synth and you can play more than one note at a time on it. So I've got the organ and, and, and the synthesizer and hit these chord buttons and they uh, wrote Atmosphere, Joy Division track, and just seemed to write it there in the studio. I think we wrote the music and then he wrote the words that night and then recorded the vocals the next day, which is amazing when I think about it now. Whilst it seemed the North had the lead in post-punk synth pioneers, things were also stirring down South. John Fox was the former lead singer of Ultravox. He worked in Shoreditch, in London's then unfashionable East End. These modular synths were the first generation really, of working synthesizers. And then um, the companies decided to make a cheap version of it because no one could afford these, uh, or very few people could afford those. And they condensed all that down into this. London seemed almost empty in the 70s. I used to walk around the streets and there were newspapers blowing around in a car in the distance and grey concrete walls and everything seemed gritty and and, and lost somehow, like we lost direction. And uh, I wonder what that was about. I wasn't angry about it anymore, uh, as we were supposed to be as punks. I just wanted to make music for it, the kind of music that I could hear. Standing in the dark, watching you glow. Underpass is such a Palladian idea, you know, the underpass with the sodium lights and you know, it might be mugged and it's, uh, you know, very 70s dystopian, the spectral city. This was the industrial bit of London that had served the docks and done some manufacturing and both of which had gone. It was like living in a Quatermass movie because I realised and discovered that underneath all this area are the plague pits where the bodies were thrown. So that inevitably leaks into the music. That's why a lot of my music's so dark, I think. It's because I come from Lancashire. And where did I end up but in a place even more sinister?
Fox's music wasn't the only synthetic portrait of the 70s metropolis. An experimental group of artists known as Throbbing Gristle had been forging their own electronic industrial sounds in their death factory down the road in Hackney. Grim. <laughs> yeah, it was grim. It was very run down. The factory was an old trouser factory and it was near London Fields and in the basement we were on level with the plague pits, that's why it got called the death factory. There was still a lot of sort of antagonism um, left over from, I know it sounds like unbelievable, post-war because there were still people there, like the park keeper, who used to be one of Moses Brown shirts. I mean, it sounds a bit of a cliche now, but at the time we were trying to sort of reflect the sounds around us in, in some weird way. Our studio was in like a, an industrial area and there were lots, lots of different noises going on all the time. And we were sort of trying to reflect all these sounds and the way they all come together into like this weird mishmash of elect electronic experimental textures. Kinship with a lot of bands, didn't we? Especially sort of Sheffield bands. And yeah, Cabaret Voltaire, those people. Yeah. But I think the kinship was the fact that we were all independent. Yeah. Chris Carter in Throbbing Gristle was a sort of nut for Tangerine Dream and, and that kind of music. So they were sort of some hypnotic, dreamy, electronic Throbbing Gristle tracks that were actually quite sort of pretty in a, in a funny sort of shaken way. And I had the, these synths. Um, and because they were um, homemade since they weren't bought sort of off the shelf, they weren't Rolands and Korgs, um, they sounded quite unique anyway. They didn't sound like regular synths. And then I built this effects unit. I saw this design in Practical Electronics and you could combine all the um, effects together and um, put a guitar through it or a voice or anything. So I started building these units for Throbbing Gristle and called them Gristleizers. We were never punk, we're not punk, we were industrial. We were an industrial experimental music band. Come 1979, British electronic music was still being ignored by mainstream labels. So Dan Miller founded Britain's first electronic indie, Mute, to release recordings by kindred spirit Fag Gadget as well as his own work. I wasn't interested in rock and rock music at all at that point. I really only was interested in electronic music. But I thought that was the future of where exciting music was going to come from, and I wanted to be part of promoting that. Anyway. One of Mute's first releases would be strangely prescient. I came across an old Chuck Berry songbook that I had at home, and I thought, I would be like, what? I wonder what that sounds like done on synthesizers. Long distance information, give me Memphis, Tennessee. Help me find the party, trying to get in touch with me. Everyone said, you've got to release it, it's amazing, you know. And I thought, okay, um, what shall I do? Because I, I, um, I don't think it doesn't kind of fit in under the normal kind of name. And then I just thought, well, what about if there was a group that were all teenagers and their first choice of instrument was a synthesizer rather than a guitar? Because that hadn't happened yet. John Peel, I remember I'd, pl I'd given it to him and I was listening to the radio, I was with a couple of friends, he said, we've got three versions of Memphis, Tennessee tonight. One is the original, there are two cover versions. One is really terrible and the other one's really great. And I thought, oh God. And fortunately, the way he really liked mine, he played it twice. That was one of the biggest moments of my, in my entire career in the music. 
and that's the end of tonight's programme on which you heard the Desperate Bicycles, the Slits, the Mekons, Alternative TV, the UK Subs and Sham 69. More of the same unpleasant and disorientating racket on tomorrow night's programme. Until then, from me, John Peel, good night and good riddance. Getting your record on The Peel Show was one thing, but nobody was ready for what happened next. What sort of makeup do you put on? I mean, you appear very white. Mm. Well, it's, it's all natural, actually. It's, um, Max Factor is a pasta, and it's 28, which is just natural. It's not a white makeup, it's, it's normal. And then I just powder that with skin tone powder, and then just uh, eyeliner. On the 24th of May 1979, the future finally arrived. He was a punk. He loved sci-fi. He even read J.G. Ballard. But most impressively, Gary Newman was on top of the pops. I wish magic was real. Yeah. You know, I wish fairies were real and all that kind of stuff. I, I, I love all that sort of thing. Um, probably never grew up, I suppose, from that point of view. First time he was on top of the pops. I think either she phoned me or I phoned her. Are you watching this? Have you seen this man? He's fantastic, you know. The the look and the sound was so different. Sort of alien, wasn't it? I, I was in a lot of trouble at school. I was sent to child psychiatrists and things like that, which turned out to be um, apparently Asperger's. I felt more comfortable on my own. Uh, the, the, the classic loner, I suppose. You know, didn't go out drinking, didn't go out clubbing too much. So now I'm alone. Now I can think for myself. I, I went to a studio to make a punk album, um, which would have been my first album. And when I got there, um, in the corner of the studio, there was a mini mood. Luckily, it had been left on this sound, which is a huge, big, bassy thing. And the room shook, you know. I just realised you can just press one key and all this other stuff happens. You know, there was a massive amount of power in them and depth that I just never heard. Never heard anything like it before. One note. People like ourselves and Cabaret Voltaire and the Human League had all just got used to the fact that we existed and there was somebody else sharing our space. And then along comes you know, who I, I guess at the time we thought was Johnny Come Lately. Who the hell is this guy from London um, who's on telly and having a massive hit record? Never heard of him. Newman was Britain's first synth pinup. Hello, Sarah. Hello, uh, hello Gary. Hello, Sarah. Um, my friend wrote the show reading the newspaper, but your mum does your hair. Is this true? Yeah, that's right. She's been doing it since I was about four. All right, thank you. <laughs> did, she put, did she put the streak in the side as well? Yeah. I really like Gary's music. I think he made the best records at that time. I think he, if anyone, really condensed it into a form that was perfect at that point. Newman would immediately show that his number one success was no fluke. Cars was part eulogy to J.G. Ballard and part testimony to living in 70s London. I was in my car and uh, a couple of men in a van swerved around me and pulled up in front, got out and were, were clearly going to give me a bit of hammering, <laughs> you know, trying to get me out and kick in the car and you know, screaming and shouting. I was pretty scared, you know, so I locked all my doors and I ended up driving up onto the pavement and shot along the pavement because I couldn't get any go anywhere. Um, you know, people obviously leaping out, out of the way because I was in a bit of a panic. Cars is just about feeling safe in amongst people um, in a car because no one can get to you in your own little bubble. I was gutted when Cars came out. 
I thought it was really good. All this time, we were convinced just a matter of time before we have a number one record because, you know, part arrogance and part stupidity. Um, and then somebody comes out of the blue and, and does it. With sales totaling in excess of 10 million, Gary Newman was a new kind of pop star. But being at the front of the synth wave had inevitable drawbacks. The Musicians Union tried to ban me for, I think, the first year. I was around because they said I was putting proper musicians out of work. Although I had to be a member to get on top of the box. So, you know, it caused me loads of grief actually. The music press were pretty harsh. It wasn't rock and roll. It wasn't honest, it wasn't working class, it wasn't worthy, it wasn't earthy, it wasn't real, it wasn't sweaty, it wasn't manly, it was pretentious and pseudo-intellectual. And I, I am absolutely convinced that Newman's career was shortened by nasty, nasty vitriolic journalism. But again, if what, what they've been before me, they've been punk, the whole anti-hero thing. So not only was I doing electronic music, which I wasn't particularly pleased with anyway, but I'm standing up saying, I want to be a pop star, love it. That, all this anti-hero stuff that went before that, and I nothing to do with that. You know, I want to, I want to be famous, and I want to be standing on stages and I don't speak for the people because I don't even know them. The decade would end with Newman as the unlikely synth-pop hero come go. What lay around the corner would see the synth transformed from post-punk experimental tool into the pop instrument of choice. dawned, the future finally arrived, and it wasn't going to be alienated. A shift to the right heralded a new era in Britain, an era in which prosperity and material wealth would be vaunted above all else. There would be no room for experimental dreamers in the me decade. You were a success or you didn't exist. The big hit of 1980 was Visage, whose fade to grey followed fast on the heels of Newman's success. It seemed the future had passed the human league by. I think there were three number one hits. Certainly Dave Stewart and Barbara Gaskin, Gary Newman, and I think The Flying Lizards might have been number one with money. And I actually stood there after, after I think we'd done a couple of LPs, but, and I thought, we've just, we've blown it. We now look, look like the also rams, and everyone's taken the idea and done a lot better than us. The best things in life are free, but you can give them to the birds and bees. I want money. I turned up at the studio one day to be told that I was being thrown out of the group. And uh, it was a bit like School of Rock, and I, you know, with Jack Black going, you can't throw me out of my own group. We'd released reproduction of Travelogue and done all this touring. There was a nagging undercurrent of dissatisfaction from the record company that they weren't selling as many records as they hoped. I think I'd, I'd made a big effort on a photo session and Martin hadn't even turned up. And suddenly I, I was hearing these stories that Martin was never ever gonna, going to appear on a stage with me again, which I think he only said because that's what, what Brian Ferry said about Eno in Legends. Whilst the Human League were crumbling, something was brewing in the most unlikely of places. Basildon was a new town, built for the post-war East End overspill, it wasn't one of pop music's more romantic places. But a bunch of kids were going to ditch their guitars and reinvent synth music as pop. When we were growing up, 
Uh, Basildon was a very violent town. We had like, the highest crime rate for about five years on the trot. But I can remember going back to Basildon and going down to the pub with some friends. And I had like, you know, black nail varnish, going to the bar and ordering a drink. And, you know, I'd totally forgotten about it, wasn't even thinking about it. And some guy just said to me, what the fuck have you got on your fingernails? Depeche Mode formed in 1980. They had a spot at their local disco. Well, Crocs was a really ordinary disco. Well, there was a crocodile, yeah. <laughs> it was quite a sorry looking animal, but it was alive. They had this night once a week where they'd play things like the Human League and Soft Cell, and, and also bands would appear there. started playing synthesizers, it would have been people like um, The Human League, um, Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark, their very first album. I was a big fan of Daniel Miller's work as the Silicon Teens and as the Normal, and also Fad Gadget, who was on Mute Records. Vince was sort of the boss of the band. He was unbelievably driven. To earn thirty pounds a week in the yogurt factory and, and save twenty nine pounds seventy, you know, a week to save up to buy a, a simp, you know, he forced the pace. This actually it was the original Depeche Mode drum machine that we used for live. Dave's job before his song to set the tempo. So number seven would be fast, number two would be slow, etc., etc. You know, I owned Alto Barn. That was what, what really got us to go out and buy our first synthesizers, the whole, you know, the things that were happening around that time with craft work and even early human league stuff. I was, I was really happy that the first time I heard them was when I saw them play live, because they're fantastic live. They started and I thought, wow, this sounds, this sounds interesting. It's like four little mono synths kind of teetering on beer crates. They had a little fan base with them, and the, the fans weren't watching the band. They were just dancing. Miller first saw Depeche Mode supporting Fag Gadget in East London. He signed them to Mute. You know, none of us knew what we were doing. By the time I met Depeche, we'd just released our first album. Compared to them, I was an experienced industry person. But actually, I knew nothing. You know, they needed a bit of help in the studio. So I think, you know, first of all, I introduced them to some ways of working using sequences. They'd never used a sequencer before. Everything was like played by hand. This is the legendary ARP 2600, but it's second hand in 1979. Um, it was being sold, one of three being sold by uh, Elton John's road crew after a world tour. Being used extensively on all the Depeche Mode albums I was involved with, especially on the first album where it was really the uh, one of only two synths that we used. You can hear it going out of tune on that note there. It's not very in tune at all, but... I had this thing under my arm. Fletcher would have um, a Moog. Martin had a Yamaha, I think, on the train. So when we did our first Top of the Pops, you know, we were on the trains with these. With our synthesizers. You got the train to Top of the Pops? Yeah. yeah from uh, Basel into... Uh... During our pop period, you know, we had lots of fans, and a lot of people liked us, but a lot of people hated us. But certainly the 80s um, was a, a real old battle royal between us and journalism in, in general, music journalism. Oh, it was just really, you know, um, pop. It was, you know, I think we, I can understand why people hated what we did, you know, looking back on it now, and it wasn't just the sound, it was, Every TV that we were asked to do, we did. And it didn't matter how stupid it was. You know, there's something very un-British about electronic music, to start with. They want bands to be like they were in the 60s, really. Four guys, 
guitar, bass and drums, pretty lead singer, skinny jeans, you know, conventional kind of thing. And that's really what sells newspapers, I guess. Playing on my radio and saying that you had to go. I mean, they'd written Depeche Mode off anyway as a teeny bop band, a one-hit wonder, especially once Vince left, they thought, well, that's over, you know. In November 81, Clark unexpectedly quit. I was and still am a bit of a control freak, so, you know, and with the advent of computers and sequences, I realised that I could make all of the music myself. You know, I didn't need necessarily other people to play the parts. And I got a real satisfaction out of programming all of the parts myself. Without their chief songwriter, it seemed the game was up for Depeche Mode before they really got going. In the same year, a reversal of fortune had seen a new luck human league finally get in on the pop action, partly thanks to a lineup change that took them out of the pages of The Enemy and put them on the front page of Smash Hits. We got Joanne and Susan simply because we, we were booked to do a European tour and Martin and myself became unable to be in the same group and we just thought, hmm, well, got some nice high vocals, yeah, yeah, let's, let's try a girl. Let's be a bit different and, and, and try a girl. Um, and from that, it, the step was that, that if we were going to take a girl on the road with, with a load of uh, terrible brandy idiots like us, there ought to be two of them to look after each other. And, and Joanna Susan turned up. I was being sarcastic there, by the way, with, with, with sitting there reading books, really. Oki spotted the girls dancing in a futurist nightclub in Sheffield. Our parents thought there's some ulterior motive, something's going on. But then um, Philip came round and met both sets of parents and they thought he was a decent enough guy. And then we went to school with our parents and they talked to the head teacher who thought that it would be good. Good, good for our education to have six weeks going around Europe because we could go to art galleries and things like that. We never went to said art <laughs> galleries. We did go to a lot of clubs. Yeah, we went to we went to Cologne Cathedral too. That was about the most that was about the most cultural thing we ever did. It also meant that we could appeal to women as well as men. The, the early Human League was a, a very male based group and, and, and really only lads in long coats liked us. And some transvestites. Okay, pop music, let's go. <laughs> Anyone here like a human being? Released in 81, Dare crystallized the new synth pop sound. We did something that could only be done at that stage. While we were doing it, they were bringing the machines in that enabled us to do it. For instance, the very first Lindrum, I think, that arrived in England, came into our studio and we took the drums off sound of the crowd and put the Lindrum on. And without that, prob probably it wouldn't have worked. I mean, I, I remember when Martin Rushant got the Lindrum and it was like a child at Christmas getting, you know, the first fire engine or something, and he was jumping up and down, and all the boys were, you know, like, oh, it's a drum, you know, because before that, apparently the drums had been the hard, one of the hardest things to do, mm. and now there was this box that was sort of this big, and, and you could program it, and, and they were all very excited, and we were a bit like, 
Okay, boys. Now the floodgates were open, the rush to market swept every aspect of British life in the early 80s. Everything was now up for grabs, including pop music. In an attempt to eclipse his ex-bandmates, former Human League member Martin Ware would cash in on the times with a concept album. When we were doing the day shifts, they were doing the night shifts in the same studio. They were making dinner, we were making penthouse and pavement. I've never been so motivated in my life, believe me. I said, we're going to make it stylish, fantastic. Finally, the shackles are off. We can start using other instruments because it's, you know, the original manifesto is broken. But we're still going to make it predominantly um, electronic. And so the idea was that suddenly we're not a group. We are ripping open the facade and going, no, this is great music, but it's a business. It really is a business. It doesn't matter, Bob Dylan can sing all he wants. He's busy brown nosing the A&R man behind the scene. Now here comes my job. With become but ironically, and we were totally anti-Thatcher and always have been, you know, fascist group thing, etc. It got taken on board by the by the aspirational yuppie culture in the early 80s as, as their kind of theme tunes a lot of the time, like, let's all make a bomb. They completely missed the point of the song, totally, and it was like, yeah, mate, oh, I remember listening to that, yeah, braces, it's fantastic, mate, love the ponytails. Not everyone wanted in on booming Britain. Cabaret Voltaire were neither into ponytails nor popularity. Their vision of Britain was concerned with the inner city riots that erupted across the country in summer 81. People say that the special ghost town was the soundtrack to the, the unrest of that year. But a lot of people, you know, alternatively think that Red Mecca was the sound of that. And, you know, I think I've said in the past somehow that insurrection on the streets kind of found its way into the music. kind of took some heart in the fact that some people were kicking back against the system, albeit in a, in a quite a crude manner, and were prepared to take on the police. You know, we weren't paranoid. It, this stuff was, was slowly happening, you know, the rise of surveillance culture the rise of the you know right wing in america the fundamentalist christian Be in the name of jesus and then we got like the revolution in iran with um, the shah being deposed and the general feeling that things are moving to the to the right meanwhile Something strangely synthetic was happening in the sleazy underbelly of London's Soho. <laughs> well, I was going to lots of Northern Soul clubs, so it was kind of, I was listening to kind of craft work and Northern Soul, so, which kind of, you know, where things developed from really in my head. <laughs> We had the money, we'd come to Soho and just hang around Soho and just get an ideas, which is why, where the, the name came from. Sometimes I feel I've got to run away. And non-stop about it, Cadre. It was the Raymond Review Bar back in like 1980 or whatever, and that's that's where that photograph's from. Because we, we were just kind of fascinated by being like these two nor northern hicks in the sticks. And suddenly we're like, wow, this is amazing. It was, it was a sort of, it's kind of glamorous and dangerous and lots of neon light and, and stuff, which we were kind of fascinated by. Now I'll run from you. This tainted love you've given, I give you all. The 
first people doing the electron thing really kind of came the alienation, I am hollow inside kind of thing, like Gary Newman. Then you get this sort of second wave where you've got the, the sort of cold, glistening synth sound, but the singer's actually very, very emotional. Mark Harmon's a good example. He's like torridly emotional. You need someone to hold you tight And you think love is to pray It's like there's a passionate, super passionate singer and then the one other person, usually a guy with the, the synthesizer. And I think almost they're kind of using the synth more as like a miniature or condensed orchestra. Like they can get all the sounds they need out of this one box. Uh, so really it's more like electronic soul music. Where soft cell led, others would follow. Having left Depeche Mode, Vince Clark would form his own duo with a rhythm and blues singer, also from Basildon. Vince I met for the first time when I was 11. We both went to the same Saturday morning music school. It was a, a council rung thing where I believe he was playing violin and I was playing oboe. And even though we'd never spoken at that time, I just uh, recognised him for this, the, the, the fact there was three of them, three brothers with this white blonde hair looking like little family of ducks going across the road, you know. Once um, I left Depeche, I had some songs um, which I wanted to demo for the record company, one of them being Only You. Looking from a window above, it's like a story of love. Anyway, I got in touch with Alison because I vaguely knew her. I mean, we didn't have plans to form a band or anything. We had no history together. We just went from the demo to the recording studio to making the first record. All I needed was the love you gave. All I needed for another day. I wasn't overly interested in technology. I couldn't even afford a, a record player or, or a cassette player, so the idea of buying hardware was, you know, there's no point in lusting after things you can't have. It's like me thinking about a miniskirt. It was never going to happen. Well, Vince Clark then forms another one of these classic sort of uh, fire and ice groups, you know, the ice is the synth and then the fire is Alison Moye. So it's, that's almost like a, a template for 80s pop is, you know, the synthesizer guy, the synthesizer bottom, and then the super passionate singer, usually female or maybe gay male, you know, it's kind of, the duo replaces the rock band. It's, it's an affront to rockism, isn't it? That, just the look of those bands, you know. All I needed was the love you gave. But when we first started working in uh, Yazoo, it was like he was effectively suffering from a, a, a very recent divorce. No, it's like these were his, his childhood mates, uh, Depeche Mode. You know, this was a, a huge thing for him to go from being a, a, a local boy like the rest of us without a great deal of hope, without many prospects, you know, without any qualifications. The last thing I'd heard about him is he was driving uh, vans for R. Whites, crashing them and leaving them on the street side. Yazoo signed to Mute Records in 1982. And to his surprise, Daniel Miller found himself with another wildly successful pop act. nothing right about it. <laughs> it was quite soulful music with a very cold electronic beat. She didn't fit the typecast female pop star image at all. You know, it's become a cliche now, but at that time, the quiet second bloke on synth was, was sort of, wasn't a cliche. The 18 months that we existed, myself and Alison never got to know each other. There was no, we never went out to a pub to have a drink or, you know, did any of that stuff, any socialising. It was just in the studio working. To actually come across somebody who 
was unfathomable, uh, who, who you could not penetrate, and at the same time uh, had, regardless of what he says, a burning ambition. You know, he, he was an ambitious boy. And uh, what was amazing about it is he actually achieved his ambitions, which, again, like I say, come from where I, I came from, you didn't see that very often. And, uh, and I wanted to penetrate him. <laughs> Not biblically, obviously, but... I just wanted to be in the studio so much. I just, you know, I, I, would, I would have been in there 24 hours a day. You know, it was... Um, it was like being in a sweet shop. Synth-pop was becoming increasingly popular and increasingly grand. OMD would enjoy three top ten hits in 1982, two of which were about Joan of Arc. We were quite intellectual, you know. Pompous, stuck up our own asses, I guess you could say. You know, we were going on top of the pops with Bonnie Langford and Elton John and Cliff Richard, amongst others, and we were playing a song that was in waltz time that started with 45 seconds of distortion and had no chorus and had a Mellotron playing a, what sounded like bagpipes. Well, explain how it works. Well, actually, it's fairly straightforward. It's a musical computer, and as you know, Eric, the right hand is lead instruments with a choice of 18 different ones, and the left hand is rhythms in this half and backgrounds in this half, and it's all been fed onto hundreds of tape tracks. The Mellotron is a very, very early sampler before samplers went digital. It was a very analog thing. Here's a French accordion with a Viennese waltz. It was a nightmare to use on stage. We were playing in this tiny town in, in the middle of France, and the Mellotron was completely out of tune because all the town were drawing the power down so much cooking. The, the motor wouldn't spin fast enough. Thank you. Well, David isn't the musician, as you know, but I have a professional pianist here who can really show you what the Mellotron can do. The number of people, the number of people who thought that the equipment wrote the song for you. Well, anybody could do it with the same equipment that you've got. Fuck off. It's all played by hand. Believe me, if there was a button on a synth or a drum machine that said, hit single, I would have pressed it as often as anybody else would have. But there isn't. It was all written by real human beings, and it was all played by hand, to the point where Paul and I thought we were going to get arthritis in our fingers from playing bass lines like that for hours on end. Between 1981 and 1983, synth-pop reigned supreme. Our charts were chock-full of duos and groups who set aside changing the world in favour of making it with a synth on top of the pops. You've got to remember that it was the first time ever that someone could sit and make a record on their own. Eurythmics came along and, and they did, I remember, they did Sweet Dreams in the basement. You know, they recorded it on an eight-track uh, tape machine. Annie sang Sweet Dreams into a little Shure microphone, holding it in her hand, you know, and won a Grammy for it. And in 1982, along came a song that turned the alienation of the original synth pioneers into a full-blown epic. Ultravox would score like one of the biggest synth pop hits ever called Vienna, which has that you know total fetishism of middle Europe, you know, Vienna, it's, it's the Habsburg Empire, it's you know the romance of Central Europe. Freezing breath on the window movies we were watching and the music we were listening to at the time all coming out of Europe and the history that Europe had, you know, Vienna being this beautifully romantic, uh, you know, the city, this beautiful place. 
And you put all that together, and you've got this fantastic image. You've got this wonderful. I'd never been to Vienna when we wrote the song. You know, I didn't know anything about Vienna. You try putting that down on a piece of paper that you're going to write a song that's a four and a half minute long electronic ballad that speeds up in the middle with a viola solo thrown in. It doesn't equate. It doesn't work. But at the time when you're young and you know naive, naivety is a wonderful thing. Not to be outdone by their English synth-pop derivatives, Kraftwerk would return in 1982 to score their only number one single success, cashing in with a song that they'd originally recorded in 1978. With the model that was in England to be a hit, that was a complete different story. We weren't, we didn't expect it ourselves. The reason was the following. We had already a single to be played on the radio in England, and it was Computer World. And the man of the uh, EMI London house, he didn't know what to put on the B-side. And he thought, and he thought, and he thought, maybe two days longer. And suddenly he had the great idea to put the model from the last album, the main machine, on the B-side. And then they sent the single to the radios. And 80% of the radios played the B-side. She's going out to nightclubs drinking just champagne. By 1983, Britain had entered an era of conspicuous consumption and greed that made the late 70s seem like a foreign country. <laughs> the utensils to make percussion sounds just anything we could get our hands on. We've got, we've got this vague idea at the moment, which was used on the demo. We've got this pebble, which we got from the mud. The mud. Yeah, look, white spots, heavy, stinging nails. Anyway, the idea is to roll the pebble on this piece of metal along here, this window frame, thus causing, thus making this sort of sound. Construction time again really started to see us form, you know, as a, a basis of, of of what what we are today. That's a lot better. Anyway, and the idea is to take that sequence and to make an, an interesting rhythm out of it and to uh, sequence it all through the song, you know, so people dance. Depeche Mode pioneered their new sampler-based sound in London's Shoreditch. In those days, Shoreditch was, uh, there was not a soul around, but uh, now, of course, with Hoxton, etc., etc., it's sort of like the trendy place to be, but it wasn't when we, we were at, at the Garden Studios. It was, uh, it was not a soul to be seen. I remember there was one sound in particular that was us actually hitting uh, a piece of um, corrugated iron that was the side of a, a building site and the, the sample sort of went like Oi! and there was like the site foreman <laughs> <laughs> Depeche Mode would eventually find a sympathetic home for their music in America. For a lot of Americans, England just means gay. It's just like, you know, they think uh, it's like a conflation of Oscar Wilde and various ideas about British boarding school. For people who feel different or misfits in America, England does actually seem like this utopia, they imagine that everyone in England walks around wearing like it was actually quite a sort of dissident thing. Depeche Mode were the only act who were truly successful in exporting the British electronic sound. The band would enjoy massive popularity in America throughout the 80s and beyond, consistently filling stadiums across the land. Back in Britain in 83, the sampler was moving synth pop in a different direction. 
Suppose I want to send my loved one a rather special musical greeting. Well, I can. First, let me give the computer an idea of the sound that I actually want to send. So I'll prime it again. And now I'll speak into the mic. Hello. And we have to wait a couple of seconds now for the sound wave to come up. There it is. Hello. 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 Hello, dear. When we arrived in it, the emulator had just been invented. And it was completely riveting because it had some it had James Brown going, please, you know, and you could play it up and down the keyboard. It had a string quartet or an orchestra. It had the famous Beethoven rum, rum. And so the first record we made, West End Girls, every single sound was actually a sample played on the same keyboard, which was just like a little bon tempi chord organ. The idea was to take real life and put it against beautiful or danceable or both music. Because we were the last of the thing that started with a human league. And we were probably the first of the thing where pop music was related to dance music. The Pet Shop Boys gave us a glimpse of what the future held for British electronic music. But the band that would truly spearhead the shift from synth pop to dance music had evolved out of the ashes of Joy Division. Whilst in America, New Order would have a synthetic epiphany. Kind of a, a period where Ina died and um, we were going recording in New York. We spent a lot of time in New York and I was going to uh, nightclubs after the studio every night. I remember sitting there on these kind of steps in a club and thinking, wouldn't it be great if one day our music was played in a place like this? That sort of planted a seed in my head really that, that um, got me interested in more in synthesizers. You know, if you play an encore or something, we were, you know, punks, and it's like, you're just falling into the trap, you know. It's a phony thing doing an encore, everyone expects it, you know, and... Oh, well, let's get these machines to do a track, and we'll just go on, so if we do an encore, press a button, and then bugger off, you know. That was the idea. When Blue Monday came out, a lot of people didn't like it, you know, like, whoa, what's, it doesn't sound like New Order, you know, it doesn't sound like New Order, what, what are you doing, you know, it doesn't sound like you're supposed to sound, and a lot of people like, mm, don't like that, and then it just took off. I guess people went on holidays, they would hear it in nightclubs in Spain and Greece and stuff, and then it'd come back, when it came back, we'd buy it, and it'd be a, a big hit over and over again, you know. Blue Monday's inscrutable club cool would help it become the biggest selling 12 inch of all time. Originally released in 1983, it heralded the future for British Electronica, a new age of dance music, unconcerned with pop charts and commercial appeal, would gain a massive following that thrives to this day. For those electronic pioneers who had brought the synth into British pop music, it was the end of an era. It sort of starts, I, I guess, round about 83. It was just overdone, it was saturated, there was too much synth pop around. It's all very well it was being on the synth, but it, actually the actual m m melodies and the way the songs were structured were really pretty traditional and quite trite, you know. It wasn't that inventive as electronic music. Towards the middle of the 80s, there was not so much encouragement from the record companies to do more experimental stuff. I mean, that initial 
supernova of post-punk uh, was dying away, and and slowly but surely the the cancerous growth of market-led uh, ANRing started invidiously creeping up, and and blandifying and homogenising the uh, the musical market, in my view. Well, we were a bit lost by then. It, it, it was all a bit. We felt we'd achieved it. We we thought we'd proved our point. And it just looked like like we we didn't have anything left to prove. The commodification of synth pop marked the end of a golden era, in which a generation of post-punk musicians had taken the synth from the fringes of experimentation to the centre of the pop stage. Out of the 70s and into the 80s. At the time, it was just really, really exciting. And it was exciting to be um, a part of a musical movement that, was, that had never been done before, that was completely different. It wasn't a rehash of anything. Those early electronic records, I mean, they'd never been done before, so it was a, a fine time. I only knew you for a while. We were trying to do something new. That's specifically why we chose electronics and, and embraced every new piece of equipment we could get our hands on or afford. We wanted to sweep away all of the old rock cliches and the stereotypes and the lead guitar solos and long hair and everything. And then what happens towards the end of the 80s and even worse in the mid 90s, everybody decides that guitars are back in, synthesizers are somehow old fashioned, and you get Oasis. Horror. Has taught me 